And so my primary interest over the last, I've been here since 1976, is using genetics to apply to problems in, in conservation. So this is the, the summary of what I'm going to, my conclusions. First is that the greater Yellowstone ecosystem population is not viable in the long term without genetic connectivity. The NCDE population cannot be delisted because it is not an entity under the Endangered Species Act. And finally, the only way to recover grizzly bears is to protect habitat linkages between all the recovery areas. So first I wanna talk about the uh, Greater Yellowstone ecosystem population, which has been isolated for decades from other populations of grizzly bears. So one of the problems with isolated populations is that eventually there is some inbreeding. So eventually all the animals, many of the animals are related, and so we have matings between related individuals. And as the quote up there says, probably the oldest thing that we know about population genetics is that individuals produced by matings between relatives are often less healthy than those produced by matings between more distant relatives. So this is what we call inbreeding depression in that there's some reduction in fitness of individuals which result from matings between related individuals. You have to remember that this is in the zoo and we would expect inbreeding depression survival to be reduced in the wild. So this is a paper published in 2006 where they compared measures of inbreeding depression in wild populations to populations in the zoo. And so trying to apply this concept to grizzly bears, so the 2016 conservation strategy for Yellowstone ecosystem, one of the goals was maintain at least 500 bears. So we can then ask the question, is a population size of 500 bears, is it large enough to avoid the harmful effects of inbreeding depression that we just talked about? So one of the ways that geneticists and biologists try to answer this question is by building a population model. So this is a population model initially developed by Bob Lacey called Vortex, where we look at all the demographic information from a population, and we keep track of the relationships in that population to see whether inbreeding could have any effect on the probability of the population persisting. And so applying Vortex, these are results that, that I came up with. So again, y-axis, well, we have population persistence, and here we have years, and these different colors represent different amounts of inbreeding depression. So this is for 200 years, and you have to remember grizzly bear generation intervals about 10 years. So 200 years sounds like a long time, but biologically it's really not a very long time because it's only 10 or, well, 20 generations. So with no inbreeding depression, about 95% of the populations persist for 200 years. But when we add a reasonable amount of inbreeding depression based on studies with other animals, including brown bears, people have measured inbreeding depression in, in brown bears. So if we have six lethal equivalents, we, this line results when we have 12, which was the average of the paper that I showed before in wild populations, you can see that there's a great decline. So rather than 95% persistence after 200 years, with an average amount of inbreeding depression, it's only about 10%. So there's a dramatic decline in probability of persistence. And if you look there, I mean, one of the things you see, there's a big effect of inbreeding. The other is there's a big lag time. So it takes a while before related individuals are going to mate in a isolated population. So we really don't see any effect until 100 years, which may sound like we're in pretty good shape, except we're already there. So Yellowstone's already been isolated for decades, so we're already starting at that point. And, and I would argue that under the provisions of the rule interpreting distinct population segments, the NCDE is not discrete from the Cabinet Yak ecosystem or the Selkirk ecosystem populations. And therefore, the NCDE by itself is not eligible to be delisted under the ESA. And the, the only way it can be considered under the ESA is by concluding the NCDE, the Cabinet Yak, and the Selkirks. And so, in, in summary, this is where I started.
that the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem population is not viable in the long term without connecting it to other populations. And finally, the only way to recover grizzly populations in any meaningful sense is to protect the habitat linkages between all of the different recovery areas. Thank you. At one time, we had lots of grizzlies in lots of places. We killed them off very quickly. The gains have been small since then. Um, the threats remain severe, but the good news is there is ample potential and we have the tools by which we can achieve connectivity between populations, sort of uh, tearing off of what Fred was saying. So in light of that history of dramatic extirpations and continuing endangerment, um, grizzly bears were afforded Endangered Species Act protections in 1975. So about then, we had about the same number of bears as we did in 1960, roughly 1,000 bears, still down 98%. So let's step forward to the present time. We're up to probably about 1,700 bears. We can debate whether it's 1,700 or 2,000, but still we're back up to only 4% of what we once had in terms of numbers. But what I would ask now is, does this constitute recovery just simply in light of the magnitude of the losses that occurred between 1800 and 1960? And this is aside from whether we have in any of these populations one that is viable over the long term. And Fred would um, point it out that in Yellowstone, almost certainly not. But there's good news. There's lots of potential in terms of where we could have reproducing surviving grizzly bears. And emblematic of that in this map, everything in green has been shown to be capable of supporting grizzly bears by some researcher, multiple modelers, uh, sufficiently remote, sufficiently productive. And the darker the green, the greater the replication of results. Also in shades of burgundy are places, habitats that various researchers have modeled as uh, being capable of supporting dis dispersing animals. Notice how, how much more potential there is than is encompassed by our recovery areas. So we can draw a line around all of that potential, and this is what we get. We've achieved connectivity. We could support thousands of bears. We could achieve meaningful recovery. It's possible. It's just a matter of how do we do that in more practical terms. And I've outlined 10 steps here, basically, four that are related to policy. Um, first is the Fish and Wildlife Service and the states need to stop this ideological push um, to remove ESA protections for grizzly bears at all costs. The Fish and Wildlife Service needs to revise the recovery plan to reflect the ample latest best available science. Moreover, they need to embrace the need for connectivity authoritatively in a revised plan. Finally, ideally, on the policy front, I would say we need some sort of a special policy auspices like a Grizzly Bear Protection Act that at the very least provides the funding and resources needed to achieve connectivity um, resources that are sustainable over the long haul and, and on the ground. It's not rocket science. We know what we need to do. Uh, we need to install crossing infrastructure on our major transportation corridors, notably Highway 2, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, also I think more on, I, I, on Highway 93. On Forest Service jurisdictions, we need to prioritize habitat security over the industrial scale extraction of timber, primarily through access management. We need to require that big game hunters engage in prudent practices. The state has authority over this. They can mandate, for example, that, the, that hunters carry pepper spray. Likewise, on public land grazing allotments, we need to require that permittees engage in prudent preventative husbandry, and there's no shortage of tools in that toolbox. On private agricultural lands, we need to do a better job of more comprehensively encouraging coexistence through the availability of expertise, but also resources, sustained resources. And finally, related, again, on private lands around residences, we need to do a better job of reducing attractants.
And we know how to do that is again, a matter of bringing resources to bear. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Try to focus a little bit more on, on connectivity. Um, and we, I first started working on looking at connectivity habitat for grizzly bears around 1995 with Rich Walker uh, and we were at American Wildlands. And so th this looked at habitat that we considered good for bears and the shortest route between two points. It's not necessarily the way a bear would go, but if a bear was going, going to go, that would be the best way to go. In 1996, uh, Rich Walker improved this model by including core areas, intermediate core areas that were large enough at a minimum for a female grizzly home range. And we came up with this map showing that there, as Dave alluded to, there is definitely a lot of habitat out there, a lot of connectivity, uh, potential connectivity between these ecosystems. And um, more recently, the grizzly bear study team published um, in Ecosphere, looking at um, a somewhat similar modeling effort only much more detailed with much more fine scaled data. In my mind, this is the, my favorite map because uh, it shows all, all the possible stepping stones and um, intermediate habitats that are available to bears. I think this is a much more realistic model. Bears may move, they may be able to see from one mountain range to the next and travel to that. They they don't know they're going to head from Yellowstone to the Northern Continental Divide. This is where I hope the new modeling efforts are headed. Uh, and this gives us a roadmap for what we have to do. Um, it's a complex landscape, um, you know, lots of different land ownerships, federal, state, and private. Um, a lot of the connectivity habitat is on private land, so it's going to involve landowner uh, support, conservation easements, tolerance for grizzly bears. Um, and I'd also like to quickly mention that since the recovery plan was written, our understanding of, of extinction has evolved quite a bit. Our understanding of bear biology has evolved. And as Dave alluded to, the recovery plan needs to be updated. A lot of people complain about this, um, saying that, well, you're moving the goalposts. You know, we had a goal, we had a goal of 50 bears for the cabinet yak. Now you're moving that, but it's not a football game. And it's not, it's not a game at all, really. It's real time science in a changing landscape, in a changing climate with changing human and wildlife populations. And we need to uh, have a flexible and changing recovery plan as as we move forward what you're hearing today is uh, information analysis and interpretation that is outside the chain of command of government and i think that's really important uh, there are uh, scientists and activists uh, who see things quite a bit differently and I think more in the interests of the, uh, of the public than, uh, uh, than do necessarily government. We all know how critical road densities are to 
the conservation of grizzly bear populations and to the protection of grizzly bear habitat. And this just happens to be a watershed near where I live uh, in British Columbia. And uh, it goes to show you, I think, uh, the extent of disrespect or disregard for habitat integrity and the integrity of uh, watersheds. Uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, atrocious because this is uh, a, a community watershed. If you can't protect people, it is unlikely that you are going to invest much energy or effort or provide much opportunity for the public to protect grizzly bear habitat or grizzly bear populations, or for that matter, any wildlife populations. But you can see the remainder of the provinces, both British Columbia and Alberta, are intensively eroded. Uh, in other words, ecosystems are severely fragmented the security of those ecosystems is reduced to well below uh, uh, functional levels for grizzly bears and for that matter for most wildlife populations. The public doesn't uh, support this kind of activity and they would not permit it, uh, but they are not given access to the decision-making process. I want to close uh, by reading just a bit from my uh, from the compendium that uh, Mike uh, put together and, and the other gentlemen have contributed to. And, and essentially uh, what it's pointing out and, and highlights is that British Columbia and Alberta for that matter are, are suffering from uh, near crippling regulatory inadequacy in land and wildlife management and conservation affairs. The information in this compendium and there's a great deal more of that obviously available, um, that uh, the mortality, the landscape integrity and size, combined with virtually non-existent regulatory environment, and critically, the near total absence of public, democratic and legal procedures, which prohibits access by the public to government decision-making and government agencies, uh, who are consequently not accountable to the public, it is outside the boundaries of evidence and history to suggest even that southwest Alberta and southeastern British Columbia contribute positively to the conservation of grizzly bears in the northern continental divide ecosystem in Montana. And, and further, the potential to contribute is close to zero and declining. I'm glad you're here, uh, and I'm pleased that you're spreading this information uh, as widely as you can. It is something that's critical and needs to be heard by the American people. It is long overdue for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and other state and federal agencies to recognize the well-documented scientific reality that any truly recovered grizzly bear population will include thousands of individuals. In the Northern Rockies, this will require protected core areas, each with a healthy subpopulation, and all of them linked by corridors regularly occupied by successfully breeding bears. Creating this landscape must be the aim of grizzly bear recovery. At present, there is no recovered population of grizzlies in the lower 48 states. No existing population includes sufficient grizzlies to be considered recovered. Indeed, no recovery area is even large enough to accommodate a recovered population. Natural genetic exchange does not now occur among the, all of the grizzly bear subpopulations and no protected linkage corridors exist that can support breeding bears. Here we see a plan for a truly recovered grizzly bear population. It includes the five occupied recovery areas and, in yellow, potential corridors. Essential steps towards creating this landscape will include adequate protections for the subpopulation in each recovery area, a re-established bitterroot subpopulation, and linkage corridors sufficiently large and secure for periodic occupancy by breeding males and females. Montana contains most of the potential linkage corridors among the several grizzly bear subpopulations. 
For this reason, the state has special responsibilities for grizzly bear recovery in the contiguous 48 states. Our state and federal agencies must recognize and support that responsibility. In view of Montana's responsibilities, and given the best available science, it is clear that Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must abandon the pretense that a group of a few hundred or a thousand or even 1,500 grizzly bears can ever be considered recovered or even healthy. They must also recognize that grizzly bears and potential corridors between the Yellowstone and other ecosystems are essential to a recovered population and therefore do everything possible to give those corridors the highest level of security for bears. And of course, Montana must delay any consideration of grizzly bear hunting until the five subpopulations and corridors are occupied, secure, and producing surpluses.